Thank you very, very much, Professor Krieger, and, and thank you for, for inviting me, and thank you to the organizers for organizing this, this very, very important panel, which I'm very happy to, uh, uh, to be taking part of. And I, I, I can only, so I, my name is Cordula Dröge. I, I'm the chief legal officer of the ICRC. The ICRC is a humanitarian organization that's present in over 100 countries employs about two, uh, 20,000 staff with a yearly budget about $2.3 uh, billion. Uh, um, so we operate with a mandate from the international community enshrined in the Geneva Conventions and its additional protocols. And so that is the legal framework that is, of course, the one that we um, approach most of the questions that you um, you were mentioning. What is the legal framework? What is What role does the law play? This is our legal framework, as it were. And we will come back later maybe to how uh, it is compatible or not with, with other legal frameworks. Our mission is to assist and protect people affected by conflict and armed violence and through, as I said, the promotion and, and respect of, of humanitarian law. Today, protracted nature of conflict is indeed a major characteristic and challenge. And we see that also in our operations, um, Professor Krieger. So people are, and this means that people are increasingly exposed to multiple and overlapping hazards, including climate change and environmental degradation over years. And of course, now we, we see the pandemic as an extra um, you know, layer of vulnerability for people who are already extremely vulnerable in armed conflicts. We estimate that about, um, we have around 100, 100 or so conflicts, so legally classified conflicts in the world today. And around of these, at least 20, uh, at least a quarter, so 25, have been indeed going on for 25 years, but many for more. Our average, length, our average length of present in our 10 largest operations, so we're talking about Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Lake Chad, Sahel, DRC, South Sudan, Horn of Africa, Afghanistan, Myanmar, um, have been, this present has been for four decades or more, indeed. Um, and what we see today is that the affected communities' needs go far beyond what would typically be considered an emergency response and perhaps traditionally be associated with humanitarian action. People are concerned about access to education for their children. It's one of the first things that people affected by conflict worry about. Um, they're, of course, um, um, concerned by healthcare, but they're also concerned, by, concerned about livelihoods and economic security. And all of these concerns require, of course, much more sustainable approaches than the simple provision of humanitarian relief as it is perhaps traditionally understood. And, and that is why uh, the ICRC and others in the humanitarian sector are deepening and broadening partnerships with development organizations, international financial institutions such as the World Bank, but also the private sector in an attempt to really provide people with sustainable access to vital public services and, and building pathways out of dependencies. So the, the additional thing that I might perhaps say, because it's not immediately linked about the protracted nature, but it is very much linked to the humanitarian development nexus, is the fact that many of today's conflicts are, are happening in heavily populated urban areas. Um, and very often in middle income countries now. And so people in those places depend on the provision of vital services such as water, electricity, healthcare, education, as we mentioned. And again, in urban contexts, these require much more systemic interventions um, and partnerships with local authorities, but also development actors. Now, on the, on the humanitarian, I'll perhaps say, two introductory remarks on the two nexi that we were talking about, the development and, and the peace. And, and I was really thinking, this is such a huge subject, there would be so much to say about it, but I'll, I'll try to just um, perhaps condense it in this, in this introduction. You can see how 
there is a common presence, but also overlap of intentions and needs for synergies with development actors, because development actors are, of course, very much now also in the framework, uh, acting in the framework of the sustainable development goals, which is about leaving no one behind. This is sort of the overarching uh, thing. And, and of course, eradicating great poverty, which has for a long time been um, the, you know, the, the mission also of, of the World Bank. Now, those furthest behind are people in armed conflict situations. And within armed conflict situations, those even further behind, if that is possible, are often the ones who are in non-state armed group controlled territories. Um, one of the examples, perhaps, is the, is the recent uh, WFP studies on food insecurity and hunger, which shows very much that the great situations of food insecurity and hunger are actually armed conflict situations. So on this, perhaps two messages from me by, by way introduction about this particular nexus. The, the message is that there's still an assumption that humanitarian work is emergency work and short term and that development work is, is long term. Um, so there's a sort of sequential, um, or there was for a long time a sequential approach first, but this isn't perhaps the main difference between these areas of work or, or methodologies. Humanitarian work, especially if based on IHL, um, has always been long term. When you think, for instance, about support to detention or detainees, when you think about the search for missing persons, this is, has always been a long term endeavor. Um, the difference is not so much in time frame or scale. The difference is more in approaches. Humanitarian is, in action is impartial by definition. It is even mentioned so in the Geneva Conventions and the, the rights and obligations that attach to humanitarian action attach to impartial humanitarian action. Um, and for us, this means working across front lines. And I think this across front lines is a very important issue that we need to unpack in the humanitarian development nexus. Humanitarian action is also not about bringing about societal or economic change or about nation building. It's about responding to essential needs and upholding IHL. It remains that, but what has changed perhaps at least in our understanding, even if perhaps it was always so, but we didn't understand it this way is what are essential needs in protracted conflicts? Um, and my second message on the humanitarian development nexus is perhaps that almost all of the discussion here is about assistance. It's about nutrition, water, sanitation, health systems. Protection and respect for international humanitarian, uh, for international humanitarian law doesn't feature very much in the, these discussions. And so my message would be that it should because one of the key challenges in situations of, of armed conflict, including protracted armed conflict, is that a lot of the suffering that we see comes from a lack of respect for international humanitarian law and the collapse of infrastructure and thereby also the collapse of services comes from a disrespect for international humanitarian law. The vulnerability, for instance, of people to the pandemic in armed conflict situations, which has to do with the vulnerability of health systems, but also perhaps their poor nutrition, their lack of access, their lack of possibility to move, has to do with the behavior of belligerents. And, and I think that's something that we need to have as central. Then on the peace nexus, just very few uh, points. I think here we have less evidence perhaps about um, the contribution of international humanitarian law to peace. But I would just simply posit to you that it, for, it seems to me to stand to reason that better for respect for international humanitarian law, on the one hand, not only prevents great suffering and therefore increases the chance of having better pathways to reconciliation and stability and peace, but I would also posit that, of course, respect for international humanitarian law protects civilian infrastructure and therefore also um, creates development halls that are important as well then for finding way the, the path to peace. Um, humanitarian action is also a means to contribute to 
preventing deterioration through during conflict through sustainable humanitarian action also through confidence building measures such as for instance uh, release of detainees during armed conflict situations um, ihl is also a way to prevent proliferation and misuse of weapons which is another aspect of um, deterioration of situations and something that becomes extremely difficult uh, when we then start to talk about peace building. So I think the links here are that humanitarian actors, at least the ICRC, is not a peace actor. Peace building is a political job and needs to remain so. Humanitarian action needs to remain non-political. But a lot of what humanitarian action does and a lot of what IHL seeks to achieve through the behavior of belligerents can contribute to um, finding pathways to peace. And so I hope we can explore many of these aspects during the, the discussion. Thank you. Over back to you. Thank you very much for, for this uh, introduction into uh, your perspective from the ICRC and from IHL on the issue we are discussing. Before I hand over to Romano Lasker, I would first like to welcome uh, Vikram Ragavan from World Bank uh, to our round table. It's great that, that you made it. Uh, and uh, we are currently in the first round of questions in which I uh, invite you to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your area of work and how it intersects with the other sectors uh, involved in the triple nexus. And let me please also add that, of course, there is room for questions. And we would like uh, to, to ask our audience to send the question via the chat to Gidre uh, Jakubauskaite so um, yeah, that she can uh, uh, throw them in at a, at a suitable uh, point in time. So please, uh, let's let's continue with Romano Lasca from U UNDP. Thank you so much, Heike. So uh, the first thing that I would say, uh, especially for this crowd, is that I am not a lawyer. So a lot of what you will hear from me is very, you know, unpolished, unvarnished uh, opinions of uh, of somebody who is a humanitarian actor, at least by background. I was with OCHA for many years before switching over to UNDP uh, about three years ago. Um, and during my time at uh, OCHA, uh, the, which is the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, obviously I was working uh, a lot on the humanitarian response. Uh, and lastly, uh, during the World Humanitarian Summit that took place in 2016, the real thing that we were trying to grapple with is exactly a lot of these uh, protracted crises and trying to figure out why is it that, uh, you know, that the humanitarian sector is so professional, so good at what it does, and yet, We've been in Somalia for 20 plus years. We've been in DRC for 20 plus years. And we will be in Syria for 20 plus years if we don't change the way we work and if we don't change um, uh, our, uh, our stance. And can the humanitarians do it alone? And that's where they really came to the conclusion that it cannot. It really has to be a joint effort together with peace and development uh, uh, actors equally at the same time. So I made the bold move of switching over to UNDP to look at not the humanitarian development nexus, but the development peace nexus, which is the same side of the different, a different side of the same coin, but you know, seen in such a vastly different way. Um, what I would say for those of you who don't know UNDP is that uh, we are the UN Development Program. Uh, in theory, uh, development is what we do, uh, but frankly, we do development where development is required. Um, and there are times where it's required in middle income countries uh, in trying to help them move towards uh, uh, higher income type of status, so you know, moving, helping them with things like digital finance or uh, environmental issues. Um, there are times where we have to work with the least development countries, least developed countries, and we help them in terms of poverty eradication. Um, but as um, Cordelia was also mentioning, our real key mission here is to leave no one behind and to reach the furthest behind first. And those are the people who are in in crises. And those crises, as she said as well, are certainly in in uh, those cr fragile and crisis states that we all hear and speak about from Qatar to Chad to Yemen to Myanmar to Haiti. Um, but it's also little pockets in middle-income countries as well. Uh, Lebanon is, is one that comes to mind. Uganda, um, uh, you know, all of these are countries where we will continue to see uh, uh, humanitarian needs ongoing. Kenya, the Dadaab camp, which has been in the news uh, very recently. 
So UNDP, in a sense, is a development actor, but I would I would posit here that actually UNDP is a fragility actor. We try to address fragility where it's required because that's really where we probably have our biggest value add. Um, I, I, you know, we have internal discussions within UNDP where we try to put together all of the different aspects of our work and we try to figure out what is it that we're best at. Are we the biggest environmental uh, agency of the UN? Probably in terms of implementation. Are we the biggest uh, peace building organization of the UN? Yes, probably in terms of implementation. And yet we're also a, a development actor. So in trying to do all of these, we realize that actually what we're trying to do is address the underlying fragility. What I would say, uh, and, and again, Cordelia mentioned it, uh, COVID has really exacerbated everything. Um, our path to the SDGs, which was fraught to begin with in 2030, um, has been you know, really, really set back even further. Those countries that were right at the bottom of the humanitarian development index remain so and are lagging further behind. Um, whilst you know, a lot of the developed countries are now able to spend 20 to 20, 20 plus percent of their GDP in terms of stimulus uh, and try to reignite their economies, you know, a country like Niger or Chad are at best are going to be able to put in two to three percent. So what sort of jump is that going to give it um, to be able to put it back on track um, and put their people back on track. And if they're not able to do so, what are the repercussions, not only from the development side in terms of the setbacks, but uh, also the potential repercussions on, on peace and security and the humanitarian needs that have been met in between. What I would say is um, the fact that we're having this discussion now is already a very positive thing. The nexus as a term, uh, you could say it's trending right now. It wasn't the case uh, three, four years ago, where there was still quite a lot of resistance from all angles. I remember first dealing with the nexus when I was on the, on the humanitarian side in Ocha, and we kept on saying we would love to work with development actors, but they work too closely with the government. And the government in Sudan, in Chad, in CAR, in wherever, they're part of the problem. And yet we realize that uh, they're actually a bigger part of the solution. So we have to make sure that we work as closely with them as possible. And different parts of the government it doesn't have to be absolutely the state level, it could be uh, the local levels as well. And this realization that we had as the, as the UN has, has translated into, into big instruments, some of them legal with legally binding and some of them less so, but we have it in um, the World Humanitarian Summit outcome. We have it in the twin resolutions of the GA and the Security Council um, on, on uh, sustaining peace. We have it in the QCPR, which is the government, uh, the, 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 multi, uh, the, the member state document that they give to the UN development system asking us to work on a development agenda. Um, and we also have it uh, amongst the key donors of the DAC uh, who have come up with the DAC recommendation on the Nexus in 2019. So there, there's a realization from all the key stakeholders who are working in the aid sector, including the government, that we have to work better together between these three big sectors. Um, we as UNDP have, have two hats really. One is that um, we really are trying to grease the wheels of the international system and, and trying to integrate as much as possible HD and P nexus approaches um, in the different forums. So we take a leading role in the interagency standing committee, which is part, which is the humanitarian coordination body at the global level. Um, we're part of uh, the IA, the sorry, the in, in, the, in the development sector, we, we co-chair something called the Joint Steering Committee to advance humanitarian and development collaboration, which is again, something that uh, uh, is, is led at the highest level at the UN to try to bring the system together towards moving uh, uh, to ensure that we leave no one behind. And we're also working very closely with the DAC. Um, so we, even though we're a UN agency, we've also adhered to the DAC recommendation on the Nexus. And we're trying to put our money where our mouth is. We're trying to show that we can actually be very good uh, 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 nexus actors so that the, the development donors themselves actually change their behavior um, in a better manner. So these are kind of our systemic type of, of the role that UNDP has. Um, but more importantly, we have to prove uh, ourselves programmatically that our programs actually make a difference that we are there not only to meet the humanitarian needs that, that maybe the system is doing, but actually doing something to chip away and reduce the needs as well. Um, ambitiously, we, we are calling this the ending need agenda, at least for, for UNDP. And we do that through building government capacity, through social cohesion, rule of law and justice programs, through aid management, 
Um, we also do it, uh, frankly, through stabilization, which I know may be a bit of a trigger word for, for Cordelia or others on the, on, the, on the more strictly humanitarian side. Um, but in a situation uh, such as, um, you know, uh, southern Niger or northern Nigeria or, or Liptako Gorma, again, in the, in the Mali, Burkina, and Niger Triangle, where um, perhaps it's pretty clear whose side we're on. Yes, there are humanitarian needs, but we're trying to support a political and, and security agenda as well, to a certain extent. Um, and, um, and therefore, we're calling it stabilization and uh, knowing that uh, we have to make some certain gains from the political and or security efforts in order to be able to get that development we require. And um, lastly, I wouldn't want to forget that ultimately, um, and we may touch upon this in, in the margins, uh, uh, we speak about the humanitarian development peace nexus, but uh, in this day and age, we cannot not talk about climate either. So whether we introduce climate as part of the development aspect, but there's, uh, or, or, or whatnot, I don't know, um, but um, we have to look at things from a climate, climate angle as much as possible. Um, human rights as well, um, whether we want to be explicit about it, whether we call it protection uh, from some certain parts of our uh, industry or whether we call it uh, human rights or whether we call it uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, other sorts of terms. Uh, it's something that we have to um, uh, really bear in mind moving forward. Maybe I'll leave it at that, Heike. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Romano. And uh, let's now turn over to the World Bank and to Vikram Raghavan. And uh, let's ask you for uh, to introduce yourself, uh, talk about your area of work and your relationship with the Triple Nexus, please. Thank you, uh, Heike. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, perfectly. OK, good. I apologize, first of all, for joining late. I think when I first spoke to Gedra, either the British or the American clocks had not changed. And so I wrote down 11 a.m. And then I uh, didn't really uh, check again. So I actually was all ready to join you at 11. So I'm grateful to my colleague Esperanza who, who sort of pulled me out of another meeting. And uh, so I apologize for keeping you waiting. I did though hear most of uh, what uh, Cordula uh, and um, uh, Romano talked about obviously. So um, I'm hoping that what I say will reflect a little bit of what I heard. But um, my name is Vikram Raghavan and I'm a lead counsel at the World Bank's Legal Vice Presidency. I provide legal advice on the bank's policies on uh, uh, fragil fragility, conflict, violence, uh, humanitarian situations, the emergence of de facto governments. In fact, the meeting I was at was about a coup in a country which all of you are just reading about uh, today. Uh, and so um, I, I thought it would be a uh, good opportunity to talk briefly about the bank's work in FCV context, but also how that actually means uh, growing collaboration with other partners in humanitarian crises, uh, whether natural or man-made, which the bank has all has approached somewhat cautiously because uh, of the perception that that's really a humanitarian zone, which is a no-go zone for development actors. So I um, know we only have five minutes, and so I think that uh, I do well with slides to keep me uh, from rambling. So I'm just going to share a few slides to show you the progression because I think this itself is quite instructive. Uh, I think I might be, you may need to share, the, allow me to share the screen, um, the host. But while that permission is being granted, um, the World Bank is really a, um, uh, okay, good. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if I can share, let's see. Okay, there it is. Okay, you can see the screen, right? Okay, um, Heike, you can see the screen? Yeah, perfectly. I think everybody can see it now. Yeah, I, you, you could, okay. Uh, so the World Bank basically is a result of um, a um, conference that took place 44 years ago um, at Bretton Woods uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, countries from the world met at the Mount Washington Hotel, even as the Second World War was about to come to an end. Right? Actually, it would take another whole year because the war in Asia continued to rage even after the fall of the uh, Wehrmacht and, and Berlin in, in, uh, in uh, 1945. Uh, but um, 
1944, um, the, in, in June 1944, uh, the 44 countries mostly representing the allies um, were also some colonies gathered in New Hampshire to really discuss rebuilding the, the world, which meant Europe, right? Um, and it, the delegates at the Bretton Woods Conference really wanted to have the bank focus on relief and reconstruction of their homeland. But to their surprise, uh, this proposal was uh, sort of resisted uh, by Latin American delegates, a sort of precursor, I suppose, to a loose coalition of G77, although that did not exist, uh, who felt that uh, there was really no incentive for them to be putting money into a bank to rebuild Europe. And so they, for, they, they asked for development uh, to be put on the same footing. And really it's out of this debate uh, that this binary of uh, bank, the international bank for reconstruction and development really emerges uh, as a somewhat of a, a compromise brokered by Keynes uh, between the dueling visions at the Bretton Woods Conference. And so to cut a long story short, uh, the bank of reconstruction and development really was to focus on these two goals. Uh, and one question that arose at the Bretton Woods Conference, even before the delegates got there, at the pre-conference uh, uh, that the US Treasury had drafted was what would be the uh, World Bank's role in relief or humanitarian uh, relief. And if you go back uh, to the first draft that was produced by Harry Dexter White, who um, was Keynes's sort of uh, principal uh, counterpart, opponent, pet noir, whatever you want to call him at the Bretton Woods Conference, he produced this draft which seems to suggest that the World Bank uh, would also finance foodstuffs and other relief commodities, because it was very clear uh, at the time they were writing it, uh, the, the Battle of Britain had just taken place um, and uh, Europe was under siege, that uh, there would be a large humanitarian function. But for whatever it was worth, uh, this uh, idea was abandoned because uh, uh, six months before the Bretton Woods Conference took place, at the very same hotel where the a uh, pre-conference took place in Atlantic City uh, in the United States, a new agency was created, which was the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency. We don't know about it because it's one of the few agencies that actually folded up. It had a limited mandate and it ended. But most of the early literature on the history of international humanitarian law, you will find a lot of references to uh, this agency, including in the ICRC's uh, history, which had a lot to do with this agency. But uh, this meant, at least in the minds of the founders of the World Bank uh, at Bretton Woods, that relief could be left to other specialized organizations and the new bank would be, would be able to focus on reconstruction and development. So the bank's early loans helped rebuild Europe, but that stream quickly dried out because of the Marshall Plan. And so the bank started focusing on development and it financed large dams in Africa, transport projects in Asia, factories in Latin America as the nature and the meaning of development as a term kept evolving, right? From big infrastructure uh, in the 50s and 60s to the advent of social lending in the 60s, uh, the uh, rise of the environmental movement and awareness of uh, environment uh, as a part of development uh, uh, through anti uh, through pollution control, but also broader gender. And then of course, the rise of structural adjustment, uh, which uh, I think many people on this call know more about than I do. Uh, which is, you know, the heyday of the Washington consensus. By the 90s, however, I've sort of skipped four decades in, in, in a minute, and uh, the World Bank's, uh, the pressure grew on the World Bank, perhaps after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, as the Cold War tensions eased, for it to re-embrace its original reconstruction mission, right? And so uh, it began to sort of take on peace and conf conflict or post-conflict reconstruction work, with a lot more uh, vigor. Uh, largely, it had avoided this work after the European loan program closed in the 1940s. And this uh, really came about dramatically with the signing of the Oslo Accords on the White House lawns. Uh, and uh, the World Bank was asked to play a major role, even though West Bank and Gaza was and is not a member of the World Bank. And then, of course, with Bosnia and the Dayton Accords. Right? This is sort of where the it's, you know, it was called the new World Bank, but really it was the old World Bank because all that the World Bank was doing was to go back to its founding uh, and then re-embrace, you know, the ideas that it's a bank of reconstruction and development, uh, even though the first four or, you know, five decades of its history were filled with development. 
So uh, again, I'm jumping uh, lots of time, but they, uh, following these early uh, engagements in post-conflict uh, activities, in 2000, the World Bank's board adopted a policy, operational policy 2.30, to codify its rules of engagement in post-conflict situations while remaining consistent with its primary role as a development actor and its apolitical mandate in the Articles of Agreement, which were adopted at Bretton Woods, which are the World Bank's constitution. Among other things, they swear the bank to political neutrality. In fact, there's a new article published this week about why international organizations love to, <clears throat> uh, to, to, to work under the shadow of political neutrality and the World Bank is no exception. Uh, but this framework for post-conflict reconstruction codified in operational policy 2.30, development cooperation conflict, just in case anyone forgets uh, that our intervention is really uh, not in a peace building or not, we don't have a political or even a humanitarian mission, right? It's a development mission. That's why it says development cooperation and conflict. This framework really paved the way for bank, for the bank's major engagements in Afghanistan, Iraq, South Sudan, Somalia, uh, Kosovo, Timor, um, uh, lots of cases where this really became uh, a repository of the rules of engagement. Now, uh, we can talk about this more in the questions, but I just want to end uh, uh, quickly because um, we can, you know, time for questions. Um, in recent years, the bank has, uh, in a way, used this framework also uh, to, uh, to help it articulate a response to disasters, both natural and man-made, as I said. Uh, and uh, it has, again, done some very significant uh, um, assistance on intervention in the context of big uh, natural disasters, such as the tsunami of 2004, uh, lots of the El Nino, lots of flood dams, uh, dam bursts, uh, monsoons, typhoons, that sort of stuff. But also uh, building on its work with Ebola a few years ago, now with what is probably the most massive comprehensive response to the COVID-19 crisis, both in terms of the initial response, in terms of helping countries' health systems come up to speed, helping procure PPEs, but also now what we are all sort of fully immersed with, which is vaccine financing, uh, which is now probably the most, uh, the biggest preoccupation of the bank these days. And if you looked at the World Bank, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, outside the context of HIV, which itself was an interesting progression, the World Bank's history on HIV AIDS projects and the embrace finally of uh, financing treatment rather than uh, prevention, which was itself a big debate in the medical community, but also in the development community. The World Bank's response to COVID, in a way, uh, we helped, benefited from the fact that that debate about whether uh, a development agency should be helping prevent or build systems, but or, uh, also help find, uh, finance treatment, that debate was largely concluded. Uh, and of course, the World Bank today is, you know, sort of intensely involved in helping financing, you know, vaccines, but also not just the also procurement of the drugs or pharmaceuticals, but also the deployment and the, and the delivery system, right? But this is a, a very, very interesting development because it was certainly not considered to be core development work in the 80s, 70s, or even the 60s, right? So in all of these cases, the World Bank has really um, tried to adapt its instruments, programming, and strategies uh, sometimes quickly, sometimes flex flexibly, nimbly, sometimes gradually, to respond to a specific crisis. This began with perhaps the response to the Mexico City earthquake in 1984, and then the early Somalia and Ethiopia droughts in the 1980s, when the bank first had to deal with uh, drought-related, famine-related relief. Um, and that then, in a way, sort of led to what I said, described earlier, which is the work on the tsunamis. Uh, and then to Ebola and to um, uh, COVID. Now, uh, I see from where I sit at least lots of uh, commonalities right, between my work on post-conflict reconstruction, but also our interventions more broadly in humanitarian crises, whether natural disaster, natural or man-made. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, in all of these uh, interventions, I think the main question, normative question, since we are in a law school, and you must use that word, uh, is whether the World Bank uh, really, uh, or the other multilateral development banks, uh, do they remain within their mandate as development institutions uh, 
by getting into these areas, because these are, you know, again, there are lots of other actors. There's the complementarity principle, uh, as I think uh, Romano reminded us, um, uh, or maybe it was uh, um, <clears throat> Dula, uh, that it is sometimes simplistic to distinguish between humanitarian and development based on short-term, long-term, right? Uh, and I agree. Uh, but at the, at, at the end of the day, our shareholders, but also our stakeholders, uh, um, it is important for us to remember um, uh, that they really expect us to stay within our sort of lane while ensuring that, you know, we do as much as we can in partnerships. And so that idea of working in complementarity with partnerships while deploying tools, strategies, and flexibilities that we've gained over the last 70 years in responding to a multiple uh, variety of, de uh, of demands from our client, whether from climate or the environment or economic policies, uh, uh, you know, or, or adjustment or reform of economic policies, I think is something that uh, is a fascinating progression, uh, which uh, I think uh, any lawyer or international lawyer should study. I think it's understudied by international lawyers, but I also think it does have real world consequences too, uh, because uh, our work, for instance, on refugees is another good example of where we didn't do something 10 years ago, and today we are majorly involved in helping host communities and uh, refugees find sustainable solutions. Thank you again, and I'm sorry I was late, but I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you also from my side to all three of you, and uh, let's take a first round uh, uh, and, and get into some of the issues that uh, you have raised in more detail. Um, it struck me that Cordula uh, told us that the situation of population in non-state armed group controlled territory is uh, particularly precarious. And um, thinking about what uh, Romano has said about the UNDP building government capacities, um, I wondered whether we, we face as one challenge here um, the the old and kind of traditional challenge of IHL that any engagement with non-state actors might legitimize them and that uh, the fear of states to have international organizations engaging with non-state actors because they might get political legitimation is still a motive here that hinders uh, cooperation in, in that relation. Um, do we have a non-state actor problem here, either with the IH, uh, with, with the ICRC or with UNDP? And and for Vikram, uh, I would like to ask you: um, Could you could you well at least theoretically, if not practically, give us an example uh, of what type of project would, from your point of view, overstep the mandate uh, of the World Bank? So yeah, maybe if we, we start again with with Cordula and uh, Romano. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Do, do we have a, a, a non-state armed uh, actor problem? We definitely have a non-state armed actor problem in, in conflict situations. It's why I insisted so much at the beginning about this issue about working across the front line or not. Um, I wouldn't say that in the humanitarian development the nexus is so much a question of legitimacy, although you are right, of course, that the issue of giving legitimacy to non-state armed groups starts at the very beginning about even accepting that a situation is an armed conflict situation, because of course in an armed conflict situation, humanitarian law applies and states that are um, affected by these conflicts sometimes deny the situation of, of conflict because they do not want to give legitimacy to, to non-state armed groups. Now, that is something it, at least normatively on which we can, of course, put their fears to rest because international humanitarian law explicitly says, for instance, in common article three, that the application of international humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions, does not uh, give status or recognition to any parties to conflicts. So normatively, this should not be an issue, but of course, politically it is. But where I think we have a, a bigger, what you call non-state armed group um, problem is what I would call a counter-terrorism measure problem. Because in almost all armed conflict, perhaps all armed conflicts that we see, I don't know, non-state armed groups are um, 
are uh, designated as terrorist groups, almost all of them, both as a matter of national law, as well as a matter of regional uh, um, regimes, as well as international UN regimes. And this um, is perhaps to, perhaps to our mind, one of the greatest challenges in the nexus. And why is this? Because you have a very strong international framework, as I say, UN, regional, EU, uh, national, about uh, counterterrorism and sanctions. Counterterrorism and sanctions, I would put both in this, these are both similar style challenges, um, in which you have several aspects that concern humanitarian organizations. And one of them is the criminalization of assistance or sometimes called material support to terrorism. The other one are travel bans to certain areas. So for instance, you have legislation with travel bans to Northeast Syria or, or places where IS is present, Northern Iraq or et cetera. And of course, financing of terrorism. These are of course, all very legitimate measures and that states have to take, they have to take counter-terrorism measures. Terrorism is anathema also to, in, to international law, but also to international humanitarian law, of course, and must be prosecuted and punished as a matter of uh, international law, because many of the acts that um, are considered acts of terrorism in common parlance are in fact war crimes, such as taking human shields, indiscriminate attacks, direct targeting, etc. However, there is an incompatibility here uh, in some respects, because material support or assistance to terrorism is not very clearly defined and sometimes understood very, very broadly, which means that certain activities that are humanitarian activities foreseen in the Geneva Conventions and IHL more broadly, namely to provide assistance and protections to all victims of armed conflicts in an impartial manner, are actually criminalized because issues such as, for instance, providing medical care to wounded and sick fighters who are considered terrorists will be understood as material support to terrorism. Um, assistance uh, to uh, detainees who are considered terrorists will be considered material support to terrorism. As I said, travel to, um, to areas where uh, terrorists are present in order to carry out humanitarian activities for the benefit of the civilian population who are the first ones to suffer under the, you know, under the control of, of non-state armed groups is considered a criminal act. Um, deviate, or how do you say, yeah, um, um, deviation of, of funds uh, is considered financing of terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, pro this then, fades into the development humanitarian nexus because, of course, humanitarians are very often the recipients of development funding, or at least would like to be so, because development, but development money is much, much bigger money than humanitarian money. And when we talk about the development humanitarian nexus, there is a lot about financing. And the international legis legislative architecture then gets um, imported into finance agreements between development funders and humanitarian organizations. And again, this is normal. So development funds, actually it's the same also for humanitarian funds, but the, the issue is exacerbated because humanitarian donors know the humanitarian sector, whereas development actors and humanitarian actors know each other less and need to learn more about each other. And so it is a constant um, still issue of dialogue and discussion between humanitarian actors and development funders is the conditionality of the funding and more specifically the counterterrorism and sanctions clauses in finance agreements. Um, and we have to still find ways to um, you know, explain 
from the perspective of international humanitarian law, why impartial humanitarian action needs to be exempted from some of these funding clauses which are incompatible with it. And that is something that the ICRC has been in constant dialogue with um, humanitarian donors, the World Bank, uh, the you know, um, national development agencies, the EU, and so on, um, with, I would say, um, a lot of learning on either side. We, of course, also as humanitarians have to understand, you know, the, the rules that these Donors are, of course, subject to particularly financing of terrorism legislation, which is very strong, and they can also not take the risk of being criminalized. Um, and we have, though, I would say, come a long way in terms of understanding and also progress, particularly when we explain how we are talking here about armed conflict situations. So I'm not talking about crisis as a whole. I'm not talking about a place like Haiti or, you know, which is not a conflict situation to which IHL does not apply. But when we do talk particularly to states about their obligations under IHL to allow and facilitate impartial humanitarian action, we can start having a conversation about these challenges that we, that we have in these, uh, in these funding agreements. But that's an ongoing discussion. And of course, um, international financial financial institutions such as the World Bank, for instance, are not like states per se bound by international humanitarian law. So there, there are differences also, and it's always a case by case basis. But I would say that's the long answer to your non-state armed group issue. Thank you very much. That is a very intriguing and, and, and interesting point, obviously. And um, before handing over to Romano, I would also like to ask Vikram uh, whether you could respond to that issue uh, as well from the perspective of the World Bank. So, but first, Romano, please. Yeah, I mean, I think the issue of non-state armed actors, I think, is is um, it's a it's a big conundrum. You know, what were we doing in northeast Syria? What were what are we doing in in Boko Haram uh, uh, held areas? What were we, what have we been doing for the last uh, 30, 40 years in in central Colombia? Um, and and you know, are we doing the right things? And and will it come back to the usual uh, arguments that were made back in the days of Biafra that that uh, that humanitarians are actually perpetuating the conflict rather than necessarily uh, resolving it? That's always been. Uh, you know, an accusation that's been at the back of the minds of, of everyone. Um, I think the legal challenges that uh, that Kodula you you brought uh, on, uh, brought up on on the on the counterterrorism is exactly the crux of the matter. You know, when is it that you're doing the right thing but you're being criminalized for it? If you have to provide you know uh, sacks of rice in South Central Somalia, but to do that you have to pass a checkpoint, and to and at that checkpoint you have to pay a bribe. Um, are you are you uh, you know financing um, an armed group? Potentially yes, but is that the cost of doing business in order to be able to achieve your mandate? Uh, probably yes too. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an answer to cop out um, and and uh, make my life easier as as UNDP, which is to say that um, you know sometimes people look at the nexus approach and think that everybody has to be a nexus actor. We have to we have all to be able to do. Uh, humanitarian development and peace work, um, and we have to all do it rather seamlessly. We're all triple mandated organizations. But Cordula, you mentioned it as well, we're not. Um, and UNDP fundamentally is a development actor. Um, but what is not happening, and which is where the nexus approach that we're trying to push forward is really key, is that we have to know what each other is doing. And that is not known well enough. Uh, we know, for example, that IDA 19 uh, um, has a fantastic uh, amount of money massive envelopes for a lot of the countries where we're working with that, 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 are, that, that are crises. Um, and uh, we know that there's a refugee sub-window, we know that there's other crisis sub-windows as well, um, and yet we're not able to influence it. And when we speak to the World Bank rep on the ground, um, you know, they say, well, the money has been committed to be spoken to the Ministry of Finance. Um, or when we speak to the donors, often they will say, listen, you can talk to me about the money that's going on the humanitarian side, but in the meantime, we're giving X billion dollars or X million dollars as direct budget support to the government of, you know, dictator X or, or autocrat Y. Um, and you can't talk to us about that. Um, so, you know, even holding everybody to account to be able to say, listen, we're all in this together. We have to 
uh, we have to really act consistently in whatever forum we're in. So, you know, for example, I speak to um, some donors um, and I see them uh, and different aspects of those donors in different forums. I see how they speak to me in the executive board of UNDP. I see how they speak in, in OCHA's uh, uh, humanitarian groups in terms of how they want humanitarian funds to be spent. And I see them also speaking at the peace building uh, commission. And it's, you know, same donor, three different perspectives. And I know it's easy for me to go and blame everything on the donors, but the donors aren't, aren't everything. It's also what the government is doing itself and what we as agencies also um, uh, portray ourselves as. I mean, UNICEF, there will be times where a UNICEF rep uh, in a certain country will speak something in a humanitarian uh, donor meeting and speak something else in a development donor meeting in the same country uh, happening one after the other. We're just switching hats very hypothetically. Um, so what we actually really need to do uh, is, is, uh, is really talk about the nexus in terms of its components. In order for me and the World Bank and ICRC and OCHA and, you and everybody else to really uh, know what we're doing, including in, in, in rebel held areas or non-state armed group held areas, is to start up with a, with a joint analysis. Do we know who we're supporting and why we're supporting? Who are the affected people? How do we want to reach them? Who reaches them first and who reaches them second? We should not all scramble for it. Um, and once we do that, then we can decide how we plan around each other as well. Does it have to be one framework where we all come around together? I mean, the humanitarian response plans from the OCHA side are very good, they're very comprehensive, sometimes over-promising and under-delivering, we all know that, but not everybody's part of that. The World Bank isn't, um, uh, the ICRC uh, is cognizant of it, but, but, but it's not part of it. Um, and the governments themselves, sometimes they're part of it, sometimes they're not, sometimes they acquiesce to it. So what we actually need is let everybody plan as there is, provided that the plans speak to each other. We almost, um, when we were talking at the beginning of, of the Nexus Dialogue four or five years ago, we almost spoke about it as a group of migratory birds, that we all know that in a certain season, we're heading in a certain direction. And we may be going from different parts, different trees, different households, but we're all heading down to that same natural park, natural park, you know, um, you know, a few months down the line. So it doesn't matter who leads, provided that we all know we're going to the same destination. And that destination means that you know we have to have a joint analysis to be able to agree what our joint priorities are and head towards it and use our own expertise to help that. So you know, one example we always give is is if we know that there's a, a, a drought problem, then uh, uh, yes, let UNICEF come with water trucking, but at the same time, can World Bank money or, or ICRC interventions come and help fix uh, the water treatment plant? Um, and you know, can we as UNDP help the government to actually manage and run that? Uh, can they have the expertise to be able, can we bring those in as well? So none of these have to be in one plan, but they have to be coordinated and somehow sequenced or sometimes happening parallel as the, as the case may be required. And then it comes back to the question of financing. And, and Cordula, I think you're 100% right. Uh, financing, not only is, is it the most necessary, but sometimes it's also the most constraining. It's necessary because it provides the incentive structure for us. Right now, uh, you know, we, we are all scrambling for money. We're aid actors, like, uh, and, but so often we're actually competitors to each other. And we're competing to see what we can do more almost in a selfish type of manner and you know not having a global direction about where we want to go to actually makes us more competitors than than actual uh, you know team players on, on on this quest to reduce the need um, and then we need financing that, that actually supports that and doesn't constrain us either through a lot of these counterterrorism type of measures that uh, that you were mentioning and uh, nor through uh, the siloing of funds um, you know, so often we see that humanitarian funds can only be used in a certain way, development funds can only be used in a certain way, um, and, and, you know, and it's also unfair of us to, to just target the DACA donors. It's so easy for us to basically go to Paris, uh, sit around at the uh, International Network for Conflict and Fragility, speak to the DACA donors and say, hey, you're not doing well enough, when, you know, we cannot control what China does, and yet it's such a big player in so many of these countries. Look at what's happening in, in Chad and CAR right now with, with the Russians and, and uh, with the Russian militia and, and, and mercenaries, with the Chinese interests in the South as well. There's a lot to be spoken about that as well. One last thing, and sorry, I'm deviating a little bit from the non-state state, state uh, group and uh, non-state actors um, uh, discussion. Uh, 
But when it comes to a real legal impediment, and this will hopefully segue well into what Vikram has to say, we have to talk about debt. Because debt is a huge, huge burden on, on us being able to really shift the burden away from the humanitarian sector to development and or peace building as the case may be required. We would love Chad to be able to move on and to be able to have the money to be able to uh, provide basic essential services in the east, uh, sorry, in the west, in the, in the Lake Chad Basin area, but they don't. They don't have the money because they're, they're in debt. They haven't managed themselves well um, and they're under more, more scrutiny. Forget about the, the death of Debbie and what's going to happen right now in, in Chad. But you know how how do we overcome um, these restrictions that come in terms of what sort of money they can get and how they can use it, uh, based on the fact that they're heavily indebted and there doesn't seem to be a way out. And as a consequence, humanitarians are forced to step up and forced to do more than just humanitarian work. They do, you know, if you ask most organizations if they're doing only life-saving work, they would say no. It's a mission creep of the humanitarian into development in these areas that is frankly not their expertise um, and nor should they be necessarily held accountable for them. But the system has been such that they've been, they've been forced to do so. Back to you, Heike. Sorry, oh, you're sorry. Mute. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Romano, that uh, uh, really, uh, yeah, gave us uh, yet another perspective on, on, on the issue and, and uh, uh, yeah, it intensified uh, the the problem that Cordula has described. So, Vikram, what's what's uh, your perspective on Cordula's argument about financing conditionality, uh, and and what about the limits of the mandate? Yes, thank you. No, I'm now a bit confused. Is the question um, to about non-state actors to me, or was it? Uh something else, because I think you also said I should reflect on that. So I'm happy to do whatever you want. <laughs> well, two questions. First question, uh, I would like to, to ask you to respond to Cordula and, and the argument about the problem of financing and terrorist sanctions. And uh, uh, also the second question would then be, uh, what about the limits of uh, the mandate? So Cordula's question, which I, I, I need to just find, yeah, okay. So this is about non-state actors, right? Um, uh, the, um, I think that, and then picking up maybe from what, um, um, what Romano also mentioned, um, I think for the World Bank, the idea of non-state actors is an interesting challenge, which we are just beginning to grapple with, uh, in part because the people at the Bretton Woods Conference obviously did not foresee this issue but we can't blame everything on only the, on the on the mostly men who attended that conference. Uh, but I think that uh, when the World Bank sort of re-embraced its reconstruction mandate, it did so in a very conventional mold, right? Uh, the both the Bretton Woods institutions are very much state-centric institutions, both in terms of their architecture and DNA, but also in who their clients are, with the exception of the International Finance Corporation of. Uh, which is one of the affiliates, which is a private sector facing institution, but all the other sort of public sector organizations of, the, of uh, parts of the World Bank and the IMF are really, the state is the primary counterpart. And this is then sort of hardwired in, in, in two uh, um, constitutional principles, if you will, uh, in the articles of agreement of the World Bank. Uh, one is the political prohibition principle which uh, Keynes and others were very keen on, which in no uncertain terms, the articles uh, admonish the World Bank to refrain from any activities uh, that would uh, basically constitute political interference. And uh, this um, idea of what is political interference has evolved over the years. Um, but uh, it also means that you, you know, when you engage in a country, you also ensure that you know, you do so in a manner that respects what the government in power uh, basically believes, right? Uh, in terms of uh, who, uh, who is a proper interlocutor. So uh, that as well as the state consent requirement, which is uh, sort of explicitly in one, in one of the organization's articles, the World Bank is a group of five uh, and more implied in the other as a function of international law that, uh, and the territoriality principle. Both these principles, the principles of non, no, no political interference and state consent, in a way limit our, our, our room to maneuver, especially since our loans or our financings have primarily the government as the recipient or uh, use them as a pass through. 
So um, that being said, of course, you know, the World Bank's uh, environmental and social frameworks um, and then, you know, overall um, sort of emphasis on participation, consultation, stakeholder engagement, obviously uh, is broader than, you know, your traditional counterparts in the executive branch. And so non-state actors in that sense are probably also one of the stakeholders that the World Bank needs to deal with, uh, even if, uh, uh, you know, out of necessity in some cases, especially if you want to provide development solutions or basic service delivery in areas that are insecure or outside the control of the government by the day or, you know, by the night. And in that sense, I think there's a growing realization uh, in many parts of the World Bank that we have to deal with this issue of non-state actors. The challenge, of course, is to get a institution that really is run by shareholder member states uh, and by, uh, in a way, international finances uh, who tend to be more conservative uh, and, and risk averse to allow the World Bank an authorizing framework for this sort of engagement. And I think that's the challenge we are presently grappling with uh, in multiple contexts. Uh, it was certainly a challenge we faced in Myanmar until the more recent developments overshadowed our overall engagement in that country, but non-state actors was one of the issues there. Uh, it has worked, for instance, in Sri Lanka. When I was a young lawyer, I you know, was sent out to meet uh, the non-state actors there. Um, uh, it certainly would be an issue if we were on the ground in Syria, which we are not. Um, and it has certainly been an issue in the Philippines uh, in the context of the Bangsamoro and the regional devolution arrangements. Um, but some of the criteria that Cordula mentioned uh, in a way get amplified at the bank in terms of our uh, uh, issues um, uh, in terms of what we can and can't do. Um, and, and I think that the one would be this you know, state consent because governments who are principal counterparts often reject uh, even the, you know, the very mention of non-state actors as potential stakeholders for us to engage with. Um, and engagement can, you know, you know, this can, we need to really carefully thread the line here. Um, and then uh, there is, of course, the issue of the legitimation problem. Uh, for instance, in Sri Lanka, the government continued to provide healthcare and uh, uh, education services in areas under the uh, Tamil Tigers control. Uh, but there have been cases where states have stopped delivering services to these areas uh, because they feel that it would be a legitimate, you know, there would be a legitimation issue. And the World Bank too, in that sense, has to be mindful of that, right? Which is that by if you how far can you go in dealing with them as counterparts with a small c without uh, complicating the legitimation issue which for us is a real issue because of the political principle that no polit politics interference then the issues of the impact on our privileges and immunities which of course every institutional lawyer must uh, is is uh, required to obsess with because it's sort of our bread and butter but it's a real issue right uh, what happens uh, especially now with the us supreme court's decision uh, in the in the IFC jam case, right? Where I mean, if the one principle is international institutions must stay within their lane and and are only protected within uh, areas that are within their core functional uh, mandate, uh, if we take undertake activities beyond what is defined as our policy framework uh, with the stakeholders that are non traditional uh, or outside the the uh, you know the domain of our regular interlocutors what does that do to our privileges and immunities? And that for lawyers at least is, is something we need to worry about. As of also the personal risk to bank staff uh, who are not necessarily uh, fully protected. I mean, we are protected uh, in a, when we work, when I went to meet the Tamil Tigers, it was illegal for me as an Indian to do so, but I went of course with the cover of my UN uh, affiliated passport. But I do think that uh, there is the issue as, um, you know, um, uh, anti-terrorism regimes impose personal liability. The question of whether then our staff members are also then exposed uh, to liability that the, the, the protective immunity of the organization may not be fully uh, able to address, right? And so these are, again, uh, issues that the UN has lots of experience with, uh, which would probably be, you know, trivial uh, in some cases because, you know, the UN is constantly engaging with them. But for, for more cautious development agencies, it's an issue where we are learning. This is, we need to have a lot of humility here. We just don't know the answers. Um, and then of course, perception and optics, right? Uh, which is uh, you know, 
does the bank's dealings with non-state actors signal legal recognition or political acceptance of their claims or policies? So those are some of the, the uh, conundrums we face. But uh, with all that, this is an issue which we're actively thinking about in the bank. And I think I would just stop there because um, uh, it is something which is a fairly current topic uh, for internal debate. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, our time is, is uh, really flying, and uh, but, but we have started a bit later, so maybe we can sneak uh, into some more minutes uh, and have some questions from the audience. Uh, Guidry, what, what do we have? Uh, do we have questions? We do, yes. So there is a question from um, Sophie. Sophie, I can see you. I cannot see you. And then there's Ashley's question. Sophie, floor is yours. Can you hear me or? OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I my question would um, uh, I would uh, like to address to uh, Romano Lasker. Um, thank you so much, firstly, for your presentation and for your intriguing insights. And um, I'm very interested in uh, the role of human rights um, in your work. And that's really interesting for me because you have both the humanitarian as well as the development perspective. And I would firstly, my first question would be, um, uh, since UNDP started really early to, to um, get engaged with human rights and development around the millennium, then my question would be, um, what do uh, human rights-based approaches to development programming, um, what, what is their, their role um, or what, does, what role does UNDP see for them in protracted conflict situations uh, specifically? Um, and then my second question would be a more um, a more general one, um, um, and that would more be um, what role does international human rights law play in general in the debates about the humanitarian development nexus? Um, is there any consideration at the policy level? And yeah, that these will be my questions. Thank you. Okay, Romano, so please uh, have a go. Okay, um, thank you for putting me on the spot on uh, what is possibly my weakest area. Um, that's something that usually my other colleagues um, are, are, are much more um, uh, abreast on. Um, so I actually, I don't think I'll be able to answer your question, but I'll be happy to, to put you in touch with, with the relevant colleagues on, on what is the role for, for UNDP in promoting human rights and particularly in, in, in crisis context. I do know that we support uh, national human rights commissions and we, we, we do provide support uh, in, as required to the ministries of justice when it comes to rule of law and justice. And there are times when we have to be involved with them when it comes to issues of social cohesion or issues related to housing, land and property, which are often the, the sources of contention in, in many of these crises. Um, but unfortunately, I can't go into, in, into much more detail about that question. The second one is, is actually, uh, I felt that your second question was actually the, the, the premise of uh, our, our whole discussion today, which is, you know, how is, uh, how is uh, law essentially and human rights law to a certain extent? And what is the policy level discussion that's taking place uh, when it comes to the nexus? And I think as, as Cordula and, and others have mentioned from different angles, um, it's not really happening. It's not really happening at, at, at within the nexus uh, 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 framework of discussions. Um, what we do know, though, is that um, that there is a, a, a clear need for us to work better together, and we're trying to iron out where possible where the the humanitarian law or other human rights or other laws are um, uh, issues are, are basically coming up. What I would say, especially when it comes to the international humanitarian law, and, and Cordula, forgive me if I'm going to be a little bit provocative, you know, international humanitarian law and particularly the, the humanitarian principles center around independence, humanity, impartiality, and a fourth one, which I always forget. Um, but uh, what's, what's, uh, what's perhaps provocative here for, for I don't know, for, for the audience here is, so many times the humanitarian agencies um, hide behind the fig leaf of humanitarian space and humanitarian principles, saying that we have to be independent from the government, we have to be you know, needs-based, we have to go where it's required to the people who are absolutely in need. Um, and we cannot be involved in the political process or we cannot be involved with, with 
the Jisang in, in the Sahel or with MONUSCO in, uh, in, uh, in the Congo. Yet at the same time, um, it's pretty clear that even humanitarian agencies have implicitly or explicitly a political agenda. Uh, we are funded uh, as humanitarian agencies by the same five to 15 donors, depending on what country, uh, to the majority of the level. Uh, the, many of these same countries are supporting the national government themselves. Uh, and so there's a partiality there, certainly towards the government and certainly towards um, those who are paying our salaries. Now, whether we like it or not, or whether we still take the money, but we do it in, in a slightly more neutral fashion, um, that's, that's, uh, that's a tightrope that all of us uh, walk on. Um, and at the same time, we have to still go back to certainly the Geneva Conventions as much as, we, as possible. Um, and as well as walking the tightrope of other things like the counterterrorism type of um, uh, restrictions uh, that, that, that are coming on board as well. So it's, uh, uh, it, you know, the nexus is definitely going to challenge that. One possible way to cop out of that is to basically say, let everybody do what they're best at. Let the humanitarians be humanitarians, let the development be development. Uh, and again, just make sure that we're sequenced and aligned together well enough. So yes, uh, you know, UNDP is always going to be first and foremost, a support to the government. So we will always have our program document linked to the national development plan. And uh, as uh, Vikram was also saying th that th there has to be national consent. So the World Bank is also bound by that. There may be a couple of instances, Yemen comes to mind, of course, uh, Vikram, where, where you're able to somewhat skirt that a little bit, but more often than not, we're bound by, by, by those principles where perhaps the ICRC and certainly some of the more humanitarian organizations, including an MSF or, or also some UN agencies with a humanitarian hat are possibly able to, to, to skirt around that. But uh, again, the, the idea of a, of a nexus approach is provided that we all know what we're doing, we can actually have a better, um, a, a better impact on the ground, which is again, it seems like the easiest thing to do, but uh, for up until now has been really very difficult to implement. Over. Thank you. We have a direct reaction from Cordula, which I would like to hear. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Sophie, for, for your question. The, the, it's interesting because this question about human rights, in a way, you had a lot of discussion first about development and human rights. And I would argue that that is an argument that has led to almost all big development organizations having uh, rights-based approaches. So if you look at UNDP, if you look at UNICEF, they, you know, they talk about rights-based approaches. It's a little bit different for the World Bank, but I would also ask, uh, argue that the World Bank is first and foremost a bank. Um, now, and then there was a, a discussion which was sort of in the early 2000s between humanitarian actors and human rights actors about uh, you know, human rights in, in armed conflict. And at that time, I would say, so it took a long time and, and humanitarians were perhaps um, at that time, at least certainly the ICRC was still sort of opposing this needs based approach with a rights based approach. I think we're definitely beyond that issue because one, I think, doesn't contradict the other. So, you know, we, of course, have a needs based approach in the sense that we intervene in the field on the basis of a needs assessment of what are the issues that people are facing. That doesn't exclude a rights-based approach, which is about, so what are the legal protections that, you know, people benefit from when we intervene? Um, so I think theoretically these two don't, don't exclude each other. And I think your question is particularly relevant in protracted situations, because again, in protracted situations, you will get essential needs of people that um, in a way can through interpretation also sometimes be understood as needs protected by IHL but sometimes will go further so you know economic livelihoods etc things that IHL doesn't address freedom of movement things like this and I would say humanitarian actors it's a bit difficult to make a general statement because different humanitarian actors are comfortable with different levels of engagement on human rights. I would say the ICRC would be quite comfortable talking about human rights when it comes to things that are linked to essential needs, but not when it comes to things 
that will relate to societal change or highly political questions. So we will be less comfortable with issues like freedom of expression, which isn't really something that the ICRC as a humanitarian organization deals with. Um, but we will be very comfortable with human rights to education or healthcare, for instance, because there's also a great overlap with what we do and, and, um, and, and also with what IHL provides. So I think it's, it's quite a nuanced picture about uh, humanitarian actors and, and um, human rights issues, which is a little more cautious than that of development actors, um, which in a way, perhaps personally, I sometimes find unfortunate, but on the other hand, I think is understandable when you look at the restrictions of, hu of humanitarian actors um, in the field, and also the, the activities that they carry out, which again, I think mainly um, are mainly about, you know, essential needs and dealing with the life and dignity of people in, 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 these, armed in these protracted armed conflict situations. But I think there is, there is still an evolution there, and I think it's, a, it's an extremely complex question for humanitarian organizations to, to look at. Thanks. Thank you. And also Vikram uh, wants to um, uh, step in. So yeah, no, I, I wouldn't uh, say too much because uh, I, I have very little to contribute on this question of human rights and humanitarian law, which I find interesting, but it's an area that again, the World Bank with humility, which is not something you probably associate with the international financial institution. But anyway, in this context, at least, we have a lot to learn. Um, but since Romano mentioned Yemen, I just wanted to clarify, uh, we are not skirting around the rules there. It's an interesting um, uh, nugget, actually, which I think many international lawyers will find interesting. The policy I showed you in my early part of the presentation, Operational Policy 230, which is our overall framework for development, cooperation, and conflict, uh, begins with the incantation from the Articles of Agreement that the World Bank uh, is an institution, a shareholder-based institution, which is committed to its uh, charter principles, which include the non-interference in its, in, in its members' internal uh, political affairs. So that's you know proclaimed from the rooftops. It then goes on to say that the bank's intervention in a member country is based on consent, right? Codifying the territoriality principle, but also uh, there is some reference in, in, in the articles itself. But it then has an interesting, takes an interesting turn, which I think many international scholars have either ignored or have not noticed. It says, where there are two governments in power, the World Bank acts in accordance with its policy on de facto governments, which is a policy which as of this morning has been triggered now in Mali, in Chad, uh, in Myanmar and a fourth country that I can't remember uh, and will certainly be uh, uh, triggered in another case soon. Um, this policy of de facto governments is one which actually is a very long standing policy. It goes back to the 50s. Well, what do you do with coups, right? And what uh, the uh, policy on cooperation, uh, development cooperation conflict says, when you have to find state consent and there are competing governments claiming power, such as in Libya or in Yemen to some extent, you follow your policy on coups, except if you can't find the government in power, right? Uh, because this government doesn't exist, uh, or if it's not just a matter of rival camps, but a true question of who is the sovereign that represents or speaks for the, for the member, in those cases, the policy says, and I think this is without precedent in any other international organization, that the World Bank can, at the request of the international community properly represented, that's the expression uh, used, provide assistance to that country uh, through a you know, institution that's actually engaged. And so that is actually the legal basis for our engagement in Yemen. We act, at the basis of UNDP's request, I think, if not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and certainly this has been what we did in Somalia also, where UNDP acting as a proxy, where it's not UNDP asking for money from the World Bank for UNDP itself, but really UNDP acting as a proxy for a sovereign that we cannot find, right? Or at least that is murky. Uh, 
And I think uh, whether you like it or not, uh, that pr provision, which I always say is a fascinating, uh, even in international humanitarian law, I don't think I've asked, argued with my friends with, uh, at IACRC and asked them if they have such a provision. Uh, and if you look at the Oxford principles, even the Oxford principles say you have to ask the sovereign, even if the sovereign don't, doesn't have control over that territory, right? But what happens if you can't find the sovereign? And I think this is really the basis on which we are providing uh, assistance in Yemen through the UN agencies. Um, uh, uh, it's actually, so it's not, a, it's, a, it's actually directly facilitated by the policy, but it's a highly unusual uh, sort of arrangement in that sense. And not, not one that we won't obviously resort to ex exception, very exceptional circumstances. And with the uh, uh, express approval of the board, which represents the 189 shareholders. So the board will have to approve this sort of thing, so. Okay, now I'm facing the conundrum of time. I see Romano, I've seen you have raised your hand, you want to reply. We also have two more questions from the audience. So my suggestion is we hear the questions from the audience in a row and then we make a final round and you get the uh, possibility to answer to things that are left open and that you want to clarify. Um, so Girre, please help us. Uh, thank you. So. Uh... In addition to Ashley's question, but I think Ashley's question was at least partially answered by Cordula in her previous intervention. Uh, I have two more questions and I was being I was asked to read it because the person can't speak. So this is from Ansgar. Uh, so the question is actually to Vikram about the reinterpretation of the World Bank mandates. So he's asking about the last year's FCV, so Fragility Conflict and Violence Strategy. And so he's asking that there it's underlined that the World Bank would provide direct financing to international uh, governmental organizations as regards to projects in areas beyond government control and work with civil society organizations where it regards government actions to be responsible for conflict and violence. Uh, so he is asking, is this the reinterpretation of the World Bank mandate in your view? Uh, and then I think uh, a very interesting question from Lorena. I think this is mostly to Cordula about this link between non-state actors and terrorist framework. So how, on what basis uh, does the, the, do the non-state actors, actor groups um, become terrorists, like in the sense that, that this is when the international legal framework applies, in the one that applies to terrorists. Is there, is the uh, presumption that as long as they're a non-state group, they're a terrorist <laughs> or does something has to happen? Uh, in order for that to kick in and for those safeguards to start applying. Um, and I don't, Ashley, do you want to say what you were going to say? So. Yeah, just quickly, I mean, you're right, so it's connected to Sophie's question. Um, Cordula mentioned protection as an important contribution of IHL to the nexus to address addressing the consequences of conflict. I was wondering, um, whether she thinks IHL as it exists is fit for purpose, especially in urbanized conflicts when it comes to the socioeconomic protection remit of IHL. Okay, great. So let's enter into a wrap up round and let's do it in the reverse order and start this time with Vikram uh, uh, to, to answer the question of Ans Ansgar and engage with anything he wants to. Yes, it's a good question from Ansgar. Uh, I think that um, it is not a reinterpretation. I'm sort of, I like the historical approach. And so if you want to go back to Bretton Woods, the articles, the founders of the World Bank in their wisdom uh, did say, did uh, contemplate the possibility that the World Bank could provide loans, not just to the government, but also to other uh, entities, including international organizations. Uh, but that is subject still to the, principle of state consent. We cannot provide a loan to an international organization like the UN uh, without, because you know it has to be used in a member state, right? So you, it, it, I mean, and we can't provide them general budget support that was established in the legal opinion in the nineties. But uh, if we are providing money to an international organization, organization, it has to be used in a member state. But legally speaking from the articles, uh, that was something that even in 1944, they said was okay. It had not been operationalized much in part because I don't think many countries wanted to allow international organizations to receive money a loan from the World Bank to be used in their member state because they said, well, why don't you give it to us instead? But 
obviously um, in the last uh, decade, especially with the rising uh, recognition that in many countries, uh, either uh, the governments don't have the capacity or the expertise uh, or you know the uh, the the control uh, in ter- uh, uh, in areas where the money is to be used, where uh, other in- entities, particularly international organizations such as the UN, um, or even you know entities that are international NGOs, save the children, uh, are then chosen as recipients. But in all those cases, uh, and except for the exception I spoke about in the context of Yemen, which is a highly unusual case. Uh, it is always with state consent. Uh, and so international organizations, uh, so the FCB strategy, which he read, and I'm grateful that he read that document because it's a very important document for us. That is not a reinterpretation. Um, but what did happen is in the context of the FCB strategy, uh, the IDA, which um, the International Development Association, which is one of the five groups, uh, affiliates of the World Bank Group, which is our concessional lending, um, it's kind of a clone of IBRD that was founded in 44. That I, 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 IDA is the uh, arm of the World Bank that provides development assistance. Every three years, um, they have a replenishment process where they basically get new donor money. And uh, in the last replenishment uh, process, they created a window uh, called the RECA window. And I can't remember what RECA actually stands for, but that RECA window uh, allows you to provide uh, direct IDA support to an international organization or an international uh, NGO, uh, if again, the state consents. So there too, it's uh, a possibility. uh, And in a way it operationalizes what the articles already allow. Okay, so uh, last round for Romano as well, please. So honestly, for me, not much more, more to add because I think there's a lot of uh, people want to hear from um, uh, from Cordula as well. The one thing that I would say, just a small correction to, I, I believe that the request didn't come from UNDP, but probably came from the UN resident coordinator representing the UN system. So uh, often the two are inter- are interchanged, or there was in the past, but it is- No, in one UN... case, it came from the resident coordinator and the other one from UNDP, which I always oh. thought was interesting. Yeah. So. I, um, in fact, I have advised that that it should be that way, but um, um, this is interesting only because I collect all this trivia, but in one case it came from that, which I thought was a little uh, awkward, but yes, so. Fair enough, I was trying to get away with things. Fantastic. I'll pass it back to uh, Cordula, thank you. Thank you, Romano, and yes, uh, last but not least, Cordula, please. Yes, uh, uh, thanks a lot. On the um, terrorist designation, um, this happens as a matter of either UN processes, which have, uh, you know, terrorist lists, or EU processes. Again, at the regional level, you can have, a, a, you know, designated terrorist groups, or indeed at the national level. So there is no, uh, as you may know, there is no internationally agreed definition of uh, terrorism. And so it is up to uh, you know states to designate uh, certain groups as as terrorist groups or not. You might have uh, just as a, as an example, you might have heard a couple of months back, and I'm and I'm thinking of it because Vikram and, and Romana were talking about Yemen, that the U.S. government at some point um, was um, about to put Ansarullah on its uh, list of of uh, terrorist uh, of uh, designated terrorists. And it created a bit of a of a, of a worry amongst humanitarian organizations precisely because of this aspect that I was talking about about sanctions and being able to live to deliver um, humanitarian relief and carry out humanitarian action in Yemen. It then did not happen. Um, but I understand also that the US would have given a license, as they call it, so exemptions to uh, the UN and, and ICRC. Uh, uh, for for impartial humanitarian action, but uh, so it's a political decision to designate a group as a terrorist group or not. Um, and then there was this question about whether riot shell as exists as it exists is fit for purpose in urban warfare situations for socio-economic protections. I'm not entirely sure I understand exactly the question, but. Um, Perhaps if, if I can try a, an answer, if I understand the question correctly, is for the socioeconomic uh, 
issues that arise for populations in urban warfare situations, what does IHL have to say? And I would say that, to, to put it very, very simply and, and quickly, because we're running out of time, you of course have all the obligations on the conduct of hostilities as it were negative obligations to not um, you know, target directly or indiscriminate civilians, but also civilian objects, so infrastructure. Infrastructure is hugely important, of course, for uh, socioeconomic conditions. Um, so that's a negative obligation. And then IHL contains, of course, a number of what you would, in simple terms, perhaps call positive obligations. So for, for instance, the obligation of parties to um, um, make sure that internally displaced people are received in adequate conditions of shelter, um, water, uh, health and, and food, um, medical, you know, uh, the provision of, of health care is, is a, a very prominent in international humanitarian law. And then, of course, you have the rules on humanitarian access, um, which again can be um, to counter socioeconomic hardship humanitarian access often humanitarian access often uh, seeks to to do that now when it comes though to the protracted nature of of conflict and the need to rebuild livelihoods even while conflicts are ongoing because they last so long and people need to go about their lives they need to have education they need to have work um, and that is what they say to us. These are their main issues. They want to work even in, in conflict situations. There, of course, IHL is much more silent and you would perhaps turn more to um, international human rights law in order to look at um, the international legal protections or, or obligations of, of states. And that, of course, again, poses all question about human rights and non-state armed groups, which is perhaps a, a nice way to stop and say that's for a different, different seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have really overdrawn time, but I think it was really worthwhile because this was a very intriguing round. Yeah, may, may I just, uh, uh, to correct the record, just, uh, we create an international incident. And my, since my friend Romano has, for, I actually went and looked at the file just to avoid any contradiction. Uh, Romano, I think the request for Yemen, and I, the reason I mentioned this is it is a path breaking request. And I think there will be books written on this because of this in international law. But the request for assistance came from Jamie McCaldrick, who I suppose is your colleague, who signed the letter both in his capacity as UNDP resident and as UNDP and UN resident coordinator. And so I think that's really where the confusion is. So I think both of us were correct in that sense. Um, it's just uh, so. That's why you may think it was that way, and I thought it was this. But uh, uh, so, yeah. But just to clarify, so. yeah. And he probably, that sent it, uh, he probably sent it three, four years ago when uh, the two positions were actually the same: UNDP resident uh, and, and our. And since I the see. beginning okay. of 2019, they've been delinked. But it does make sense okay. that the head of the UN, which is the resident coordinator, would be the one yeah. doing it in the future. Should it ever arise? Yes, that's good. I'm glad you clarify that. So. Okay, thank you. So we have a Solomonic uh, solution for, for this issue, and I'm glad to. Um, as I said, this was a very intriguing roundtable, uh, which from which I personally have learned a lot uh, also for our project on, on the legal framework for the triple nexus, and was very inspiring. So thank you very much indeed for your participation. And uh, I guess we would be very happy if we could draw you into our project on other occasions as well to profit from your uh, knowledge of, of the on the ground problems, which are so important for any academic analyze. Thank you very much uh, for today's discussion. Thank you. Thank and you, Heike. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.